so much. Thanks for coming for all these talks and coming for this last one. Uh, it feels like some kind of a rite of passage, which I'm completing today with my last commitment to this university. Uh, in some sense, my talks have been kind of chronological in, my, in the way I have worked on several issues. I began uh, my, my la last talk, which I gave on the many roles of English and Dalit literature, is something that I've been doing for some years. But what I'm sharing with you today is uh, part of my very, very recent work, which is coming out in the form of a book, uh, if all things equal, sometime by the end of this month. The book is called The Burden of Refuge, the same title as the talk. Uh, now, how does one actually begin to talk about the partition of India when India was divided into India and Pakistan in 1947? And this was probably the heaviest price we paid as a part of our independence and for becoming the nation state. It has been one of the most traumatic episodes in the history of the subcontinent when India was divided into India and Pakistan. Uh, in the years of my growing up, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't conscious most of the time of the fact that my parents were partition migrants, that it was during 1947 uh, that they, my father was 14 years old and he moved from Pakistan to India. My mother was barely about seven years old. Uh, but it wasn't something that they were used to talking about. I belong to a community that are called Sindhis. There is a province in Pakistan today which is called Sindh, as in S I N D H. Please help yourself to those handouts there. It will give you a, a sense of what I'm talking about. There is a province in Pakistan called Sindh, which uh, has been fighting now its own kind of struggle for self-determination, where the people of Sindh believe that they don't want to be a part of Pakistan. Now, this province is where my parents came from during partition. Uh, unlike many other regions in the subcontinent, which kind of got divided, they got partitioned or carved into two, and some part went to India and some part went to Pakistan. The province of Sindh was not partitioned. It wasn't halved. It went entirely to Pakistan. So in the province of Sindh, which where my parents come from, you had about 25% Hindus and 75% Muslims. And out of these 25% Hindus, most of them, about 20% or so, left everything behind them, their homes, their shops, their professions, their occupations, all of it, their land, their territory, and as the years would prove, in some sense, even their language, and they came to India as completely penniless refugees. Now, these are parts of my own father's history, which kind of came to me in bits and blobs at a time when I began to take some interest in it. And I realized that in the initial years, when he was a little boy, uh, when he came to India, he kind of left his school, never went back to school after the seventh grade came to India, started kind of selling sweets in trains, and started selling fruit on pavements. And, and all this was, in some sense, it did not become a part of a huge family history, because you would find very often partition migrants not wanting to talk about what they went through, because it's so painful and it's so traumatic. And then the community I come from is also a community of traders. These are mercantile people, businessmen, who do not believe that they need to be expressing this nostalgia about the past, they just somehow get on with life. But in that whole process of getting on with life, so to speak, very often they tend to uh, not reckon with their own history, and they forget without remembering. And one of the aims of my writing, the book I did, was to actually uh, document this history, which has not been written about at all. And so I started this project in about 2001, when I had done my, finished my PhD, I had translated from Gujarati, and I was writing about Gujarat, which is the state I come from. And I, I was married into a very mainstream, upper caste, upper class Gujarati family, and it all seemed to go well. And then, then I felt that I began to kind of became acutely aware of the differences between the family I was coming from and the family I was married into, which was the mainstream family of. And I realized that a sense of tradition, a sense of coherence, a sense of peace with yourself, 
which I was watching in the Gujaratis was not there in my own community. And I realized that, and I, I, I looked at myself and I looked at people around me and I, had a, I got a feeling that we were living with a far more, uh, with, a, with a sense of fracture, if you like, with a sense of fragmentation where the second and third generation Sindhis were not even, not even speaking in their own tongues. There was a certain s shame of being a Sindhi. And I began to kind of explore into where this was coming from. And as I began to do that, and I started in interviewing people, and I thought what I was doing was really kind of documenting partition history. It came as actually something of a surprise to me that uh, the predominant images of partition that, uh, of 1947, which as Manju very rightly said, is, is a kind of a watershed moment. But that moment comes to us largely through violence. It comes to us through very, very predominant and very enduring images of physical violence as people left from Pakistan to come to India, corpses you know, in the trains, heads cut off, Hindus killing Muslims and Muslims killing Sikhs and, and so forth. Whereas the history that I was beginning to document did not have violence at all. It did not have any kind of physical violence. So in one of the first interviews which I carried out with my father, I almost felt a sense of being let down because he hadn't very dramatic stories to tell me. He wasn't saying that, you know, look, we were, our women were raped and we, our heads were cut off. And, but what he was saying is that, in fact, the Muslims of Sindh gave us a very dignified kind of a departure, that they didn't want us to go and that we did not have any problems in the journey that our problems began after we came, so to speak, to the safe country of India, that our problems have been problems of resettlement, of post-partition adjustment. And then this gave a different kind of a <coughs> focus to my research. And I realized that the prices we pay for partition are not always only in the generation that does the migration, but it is also in the subsequent generations and what happens to those generations, what are their problems with their own identity and so forth. Uh, can I just, anyway. So I began to kind of uh, examine the second and third generation. While I was doing that, I also began to kind of compensate my, the observed phenomenon, so to speak, with reading about Sindh and reading what was happening in Sindh and what came over through history text through history books of Sindh was that this was a very different kind of a province from any other place in the subcontinent that there was a very very strong tradition of Islamic mysticism or Sufism that the Hindus and Muslims uh, very often had common places of worship and there was identities were quite blurred and fuzzy and there wasn't very distinct sense of who is a Hindu and who is a Muslim. The practices of Hinduism that this minority of Hindus did in Sindh were very different from the kind of Hindu practices that were happening elsewhere in the continent. So that when the British went to Sindh to annex it, they were shocked to see that even the Brahmin of Sindh would be eating meat and drinking liquor. And you have these British explorers and travelers kind of reporting with a great sense of uh, you know, disapproval as to what kind of Hindus are these. And, uh, you know, that they can put any kind of Hinduism to shame. So while I was reading about this and, you know, wondering, and beginning, something, some of it was making sense to me because I always felt in my own family and people around me that we weren't doing our Hindu practices properly. That, you know, we were going to a temple, but then we were also going to a Sikh Gurudwara, that you know we also in her we write in the perso arabic script the sindhi is not written in in the way most indian languages are written in the nagri script it's written in the perso arabic script which is associated with arabic and urdu and we also when we speak uh, sindhi we very often in a, as a form of exclamation we say things like allah so I used to wonder why we are the way we are. Why are we such a mixed up, hodgepodge kind of a community? And then gradually I began to realize that perhaps that, that was interesting. Perhaps this is what makes this community so pluralistic. So while this is what I was trying to understand, came to the year 2002, which I mentioned to you in my first talk here. 
the year when you had this very strong Hindu backlash against the Muslims of Gujarat. And I, as a part of my kind of understanding of this phenomenon, I realized that there was a lot of Sindhi involvement in the killing of the Muslims. And it came as something of a shock to me because what I was reading from history wasn't telling me this. There wasn't a violent experience of partition. There weren't too many communal conflicts in pre-partition Sindh. So then what was happening to the Sindhis now, 50 years later, 60 years later? Why were they so violent against Muslims and why were they hating them? And then gradually, I began to kind of probe that link further and further. And uh, I went to interview this woman who was a kind of a uh, member of the Legislative Assembly in Ahmedabad. She's a politician. She's a Sindhi. And the constituency that she was in charge of during these riots of 2002 witnessed the bloodiest massacre of the Muslim people that happened in that region. And women were mutilated and raped and pregnant women. And this woman, who's, the, who's a Sindhi and who's a politician, uh, even if she claims that she wasn't physically present at that time, which remains to be proven, the point is she wasn't contrite. She wasn't apologetic about what was happening. And I went to interview her ostensibly because as a Sindhi woman, I was writing a book about the achievements, if you like, of Sindhi women. Obviously, I couldn't tell her that I was trying to suss her out. So I went to, I, so I told her that I was trying to interview her because she's made such a big name for herself as a Sindhi politician. It's a minority community with not too many, you know, such achievements to speak of and so on. Uh, so in the process of interviewing her, I was asking, she said, she said to me somewhere in the course of the interview, she said, you know, the thing is, uh, what you're doing is very important, you know. It's people like you and we need in the community. But of course, we need to become proper Hindus. And we need to kind of, uh, you see, the Mus living with the Muslims in Sindh taught us all wrong things. And we were eating meat, and we were talking like them, and, you know, we began to follow their festivals. Now we need to become proper Hindus, so to speak. Something began to make sense to me that day. I realized that one of the prices that the Sindhis had paid as a part of their post-partition adjustment, as a part of settling down in the state of Gujarat, which has become an extremely intolerant state, that if you are not like a proper Hindu in Gujarat, if you do not fit into the textual notions of what Gujarat thinks is Hinduism, you need to become more Hindu than the Hindu. And, you need, and then you become sometimes fundamentalist. And I think that is what was happening to this community. So the sense I had got earlier of a fractured identity, of a fragmentation, and then the movement I was seeing in, these, in this, in this communi migrant community towards a kind of Hindu fundamentalism, somewhere I realized that there were these various links between what was happening. And that, that's the kind of work I have done here. Uh, this was just a kind of very, very large background to, uh, to my book, The Burden of Refuge. What I'm going to do now is to begin with some very general comments about partition and then talk to you about Sindhis in Gujarat, where I come from. I'm not telling you anymore where Gujarat is, and I'm not telling you where Sindh is. I'm hoping that the handouts and some of my conversation with you before would tell you. But if, if you need to know, please feel free to ask me. At the turn of the previous century, my father, who lived in Shikarpur, Sindh, moved like a temporary migrant from Sindh to Bukhara and back. Shikarpur was the heart of commercial activity in Sindh, and his foray into Central Asia was part of a financial network which developed in the second half of the 18th century. This surge of Indo-Central Asian trade lasted until the time of the Russian Revolution. In 1947, my father moved from Sindh to India, and his movement was part of a historical exodus of partition migrants from Sindh. In the 1960s, my cousin moved from Bombay to Hong Kong, and like many other Sindhis, he made a niche for himself in the electronics market until Hong Kong ceased to be a British possession and joined China. All three men represent different diasporic moments and also voluntary 
and some not so voluntary context of crossing borders and the consequent separation from a real and imaginary homeland. The three moments also reflect the frequent subjection of the Sindhi community to larger forces. For the purposes of my presentation today, my concern lies in the movement my father and one million odd Hindus of Sindh made, the context that made them feel they must leave their land, the consequences this has had on them, and the two successive generations that grew up in a divided India. In the academic and literary discourse on partition, it is a fact little documented and discussed that like the Punjab, Punjabis and Bengalis, the Indian Sindhis also had a homeland in what is now Pakistan, and that there was a mass exodus of about 70,000 Sindhi Hindus from the province of Sindh during 1947. The Sindhis drew attention, little attention from the state and subsequently from partition studies because they arrived, quote unquote, safely. The Sindhi story of partition does not live up to archetypal images of blood and gore. There were few instances of violence in Sindh and many cases of loot and hooliganism, but these occurred some months after partition. They are considered by both the Hindus and the Muslims of Sindh as results of the influx of Indian refugees into Sindh, but not as reflections of communal tensions within the province itself. This changes the contours of the Sindhi experience of partition, which was perhaps more traumatic in its moment of resettlement in India than in the departure from Sindh. To kind of share with you some of the very iconic and representative images of partition, these are from a book called, a no, very well-known novel called uh, Train to Pakistan by Khushwan Singh, which anyone who had, has had anything to do with partition would know about. Uh, these are images from that book. Something's off? You may have to maybe move a little bit to your left and then your left. Okay. Right. So this is the typical 1947 experience. So these are not the experiences which the community I'm talking about has had. First of all, they did not come by trains. I mean, very few of them came by trains. They largely came by ships. So the notion of trains crossing each other along the road, where you would have a bunch of Hindus from one train going into another train that's coming from the opposite direction with carrying Muslims, killing them, or the other way around, these instances did not happen in Sindh at all. But then such is the natu nature of partition studies that people who did not go through these experiences don't get documented. It is an equally unacknowledged fact that there was no Indian part of Sindh that the Sindhis were coming to. You see there's East Punjab and West Punjab, as in one part that went to Pakistan and one part that came to India, and that's how they, these regions were divided, which was not the case here. Sindh in its entirety went to Pakistan, and a majority of the Hindus who constituted its religious minority fled from the province. One of the richest globally diasporic communities, the Sindhi Hindus arrived in India as stateless and penniless immigrants and restarted life amidst the resentment and reluctance extended to them by host communities. The religious minority of Sindh was now the linguistic minority of India, accompanied by a considerable diminution in their social standing. In fact, their Hinduness, 
the chief reason for their migration, was also put to question in states like Gujarat, Rajasthan, and parts of Uttar Pradesh. As a community that ate meat and eschewed traditional Hindu practices such as untouchability and hailed from quote-unquote Pakistan, the Sindhis were considered Muslim-like and untouchable in staunch vegetarian states such as Gujarat and Rajasthan. The over-pragmatic Sindhi did not indulge in nostalgia for the homeland, for he became the petty and pushy trader who undercut profits and thus re-established himself once again as one of the most successful businessmen. The collective forgetting of the community enabled individuals to become model migrants who got on with life and were soon established and affluent, almost as if partition had never happened. Save a handful of Sindhi writers who largely speak to their own tribe because nobody else reads them, and the surviving members of the migrant generation, a large majority of Sindhis in India hardly ever think of themselves as a post-partition community. Uh, I'm now taking you to a very, very specific experience of this community in the state of Gujarat, uh, where, I, where I come from. And you have, in the, in the city of Ahmedabad, where I live, you have these erstwhile refugee camps, which were actually erstwhile army barracks for soldiers in World War II. And then they were given to these refugees where Sindhis continue to live even today. They, are, they obviously don't look uh, like refugee camps anymore. S many houses have changed. People also move out. Some don't. Some develop their houses properly. But they are still away geographically, psychologically, culturally from the heartland of the city of Ahmedabad. So I mean, I live in the heart of the, in the, in, in the city where you've got the mainstream, very upper caste, upper caste class Gujaratis who live. And the Sindhis are somewhere outside on the outskirts of Ahmedabad. And it is from this place that I want you to make a visual imagination where I take you now. Approximately seven kilometers beyond the airport, away from the throbbing life of the city of Ahmedabad, lie a series of tiny houses touching each other and stretching out in a straight line, disciplined and uniformed like an army. Some rebellious houses strain upward to defy this tyrannical pattern and carry upon themselves an additional floor. These rebellious houses belong to Sindhis who have done well for themselves, who have enough money now to give their camp house a different look. The luckier ones, that is more affluent ones, simply move out of such refugee camps relics of the Sindhi helplessness and penury after partition, otherwise erstwhile army barracks. The refugee camp is only a physical marker of a forced inheritance that a Sindhi does not want to own up to. For the upwardly mobile Sindhi, the process of moving away from camp continues in metaphoric ways. Gujarat includes one third of the Sindhi population of India and has the highest Sindhi presence in India. In the wake of partition, Gujarat was one of the four, others being Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan, provincial governments to take charge of relief and rehabilitation of migrants from Sindh. The physical contiguity between Gujarat and Sindh made both sea and land routes easy. Ships from Karachi arrived at the ports of Porbandar, Verawal, and Okha on Gujarat's coast. Movement towards Gujarat also happened indirectly, especially via Rajasthan when Sindhis arrived through Jodhpur railways from Mirpur Khas to Pali in Rajasthan. Since, since Gujarat had more extensive arrangements for relief and also provided better business opportunities, many Sindhis gravitated to Gujarat from Rajasthan. Apart from the logical convenience, Gujarat also served as an old link in Sindh's history. The regions of Kutch and Kathiawad have had cultural and mythological and trade links with Sindh. Thus, several factors made Gujarat an obvious choice, if you like, for the Sindhi Hindus who left Sindh during and after partition. Although Gujarat proved to be a good choice in economic terms, the Sindhi interaction with the host communities in Gujarat has not been an easy one. In the discussion I'll begin today, I focus on the initial episode of settling down as one of the moments, defining moments in this interaction. Leaving behind homes, lands, and shops, the rich traders and zamindars of Sindh boarded trains and ships empty-handed like migrant laborers, thankful to have escaped unscathed. Once in India, their poverty and dependence da dawned upon them acutely, but they neither had the time nor the luxury of going back. Distracted and caught up in their immediate concerns, they didn't know whether to search for missing relatives, 
to earn a living or to simply swallow their pride and live as refugees. When I asked my uncle, Udav Das Makhija, whether he tried to look for his friends and family as soon as he landed in Bombay, he said, silly, who had the time? At the same time, however, a mother of four sons wrote to the Maharaja of Baroda, making a simultaneous request for locating her lost children and asking for some money. She says, I'm a poor lady whose four sons have been lost in the past political disturbances, and yet I have no news of them. They are somewhere in India, but exactly it is not known where they are. I'm giving you their names so that you can please find them. I'm also sending you numbers of certain cash certificates I had bought in Sindh. If you can kindly issue new certificates from India, I will have some money with me. Very often, the tragic irony of arrival was far greater among the Sindhis than the moment of departure. The Sindhi story of partition does not privilege the day of departure, although there are dramatic instances of people escaped disguised as Muslims. It was the hostility of the local population upon arriving in India that gives the Sindhis some of the most excruciating memories of this period. And I'm quoting from an interview now <coughs> about a woman who's now in her 80s or 90s. She says, we waited in Hyderabad, Sindh for three months before we could get tickets. Finally, we left Hyderabad, 11 families together. The train brought us to Marwad. People there did not let us get down at the Marwad junction. So we were taken to Barmer, or rather desert-like outskirts of Barmer. We lived in a single tent. We were given free food, but we felt too scared to eat. After the way the locals had behaved with us, we didn't know what to expect. We cooked our own food. One day, when the dust storms were blowing and we could hardly see, one of the children fell into a sizzling walk. Those were the worst days of my life. The owner of one of the most well-known chain of sweet shops in Ahmedabad said to me, I'm so embarrassed about giving you details about how I was treated on coming here. First of all, there was the embarrassment about fleeing Sindh when we, Congress workers, were needed the most. <coughs> but I already told you those circumstances. And when we came by train to Rajasthan, we first landed in Barmer and then moved to Ajmer. I remember going with my wife to a tea stall in Ajmer. The chaiwala, or the tea stall owner, gave me a cup of tea, but just when I was putting that cup down along with others, he shouted at me for polluting other cups. Untouchability. In Sindh, we did not do that to anyone, and the Jains and Oswals considered us low castes here. The feeling of humiliation was far more common with Sindhis who came to Rajasthan or Gujarat than those who came to Bombay. The strongly vegetarian Hindus and Jains of Gujarat and Rajasthan treated the Sindhis with suspicion because they came from an Islamic province, ate meat and drank liquor, and so on and so forth. Uh, there, I went around uh, in the looking at different refugee files and seeing the exchanges of letters between various migrant refugees as they write letters to the refugee officer complaining about sometimes where they live or not having enough food to eat. And in the history of partition, the refugee episode actually forms a very, very, should form a very important part. Unfortunately, people don't look at it. Usually, scholars of partition studies look at the way people left their state of origins and then arrived, and then almost everything after that was fine, like that history had ended. But people don't see that when you settle down as a refugee somewhere, there is there are a whole bunch gamut there's a gamut of issues about the amount of money that is doled out to refugees sometimes you have the refugees showing more members than actually exist in their family because they want to get more benefits from the rehabilitation officer some of the beginning of prejudices and stereotypes against us in these may have been formed in this period uh, i don't want to kind of go into that too much right now because i think it'll just kind of distract you but what i'll do is uh, just kind of read out to you some of one application which you there are these three men who write to the refugees or officer in one of the regions in Gujarat and they say they want to move to another camp because that's where most of their relatives and family are and there is a lot of back and forth going on through letters about why do they want to move and I want you to kind of listen to the tone of this refugee officer when he's describing them uh, he says He says, as the climate of Navsari, these refugees say, is not suitable to them, they want to go to Kalyan and other camps without informing the camp officer. 
The refugees, if they take up to labor, work and stick to one place, they would soon be rehabilitated and will have no difficulty for their absorption. But as these people have no liking for any labor, they move from one place to another for a suitable and comfortable life. It would be seen from the application itself that their aim is to go to Kalyan camp with all the members of their families and their claim for their credit notes for free railway facilities. Uses of phrases like these people and general references to free things, unclean ways, idle lives to describe all refugees indistinguishably is common and it betrays prejudices. It is undeniable that the circumvention of laws and rules to make quick money were common among the refugees. For instance, the selling of the rationed grains received in camps at a higher price in the open market or showing more members in a family than actually existed or indulging in nefarious activities have been recorded in refugee documents. The frustration, anxiety and the greed of the refugees and the exasperation of the authorities who felt they had more than met the needs of the migrants were perhaps common to all departments. Uh, <coughs> then I've, there are these different experiences of Sindhis in settling down in different parts of Gujarat. I want to kind of share with you experiences of a couple of these regions. You have something called a district called Junagadh in Gujarat, which is, which is in the uh, southern west part of Gujarat, which was a princely state, which means when independence took place, it was under a separate king. And it had to be handed over to the new nation state. The king was a Muslim who chose to go to Pakistan when independence took place. That region had a very large Muslim population. Now what is happening is that, and this is another episode in the history of partition that people usually don't look at, and this has to do with evacuee houses. What is happening is that you've got this nation that is split into two. So you've got people of one religion going over to this other nation and people from that nation coming here. What triggers of where, where that cycle begins is very difficult to determine. But when you've got Muslim refugees coming from India and now coming into Pakistan with a feeling that this is our Islamic land, this is, this is where we belong, and this is where we will live safely, they want to drive out the Hindus from the houses there so that they can go and live in those houses. In turn, Hindus who have been driven out of their houses want to drive out the Muslims from India so that they can go and live in those houses. And very often you've got a lot of r ethnic riots taking place in this period and it is about houses. It is about going and wanting to live in those houses. So this is also one part of history of Gujarat where some of the initial riots are about evacuee houses. In a bizarre sort of way, Gujarat thinks it has not been affected by partition at all. I mean, it does not even realize that these riots have taken place in this state and things have happened. But by and large, an average <coughs> Gujarati thinks, I'm peace-loving, my country is peace-loving, and my nation is peace-loving, and nothing has happened here. There's no literature where all this is reflected. So anyway, this is one of the episodes that take place. And it takes place in actually in two regions. Uh, interestingly, it also takes place in this region called Godhra, which I mentioned to you in my first talk, where that train was burnt in 2002, and you had these uh, there are fam very infamous riots of Gujarat of 2002, where the Hindu passengers were burnt in a train. That place also has a very long history of the Sindhi and the Muslim riots over evacuee houses. But there is one part of Gujarat which is very interesting, where no riots have happened, where the Sindhis did not go as refugees at all. Now this was a big chunk of land in a region called Kutch. And this land was at the request of Mahatma Gandhi. It was donated by a king there, Maharao of Kutch, to the Sindhis so that they could come and like the Punjabis and Bengalis, have their own region, have their own place where they could settle down. Unfortunately, by the time this land comes to the Sindhis, 10 years have gone by since, you know, things happen slowly in our country. And by then, people have settled down at various parts of the country. They're not going to leave that once again and now come and live in this land and feel like, you know, Sindhis or whatever. But in this region, there is no history of refu refugee nests, so to speak. There are no refugee camps. And so some of the sense of shame and fractured identity, which I talk about, which happens in other regions, is not very strong over here. The Sindhis here settled down with some help from the government. And they have established small Sindhi colonies there. 
and there is just a different sense of identity there, uh, which I don't want to kind of go into great details about right now, but we'll come to a period now when the refugee camps closed down in 1949. The refugee camps were officially closed in 1949. Towards the end of 1948, only the disabled and the old, or children, were given doles. The rest had to look out for themselves, which the Sindhis did much better than any other migrant community. In Gujarat, they resented the fact that they continued to be called nirvasit, which means homeless, for at least a decade more. In other states, they were called sharnarthi, which also means refugees, and which evoked images of dependence and being at the mercy of those who gave them shelter. The next few decades would find the Sindhis trying to live down these labels, inventing new ones like purusharthi, which means a hard-working person, to suggest success and self-reliance. Uh, in, a, in a very kind of appropriate way, sometimes the Sindhis are compared by themselves and by other people with Jews as people who, are, who become successful migrants wherever they go, but then about whom there are also a lot of negative stereotypes about their business practices and you know, so forth. Apart from the ways in which their identity as refugees shaped the perception of others, it also created new cleavages in the community by separating those who lived in camps from those who did not. From my childhood, I remember an offensive word, campi, which meant a typical Sindhi, or a coarse, unrefined Sindhi. And it marked a different class to which we, living in the posh areas of Ahmedabad, did not belong. For people who continue to live in camps turned into townships in cities like Ahmedabad and Surat, condescension comes from all quarters of their community. Just as people from the Ulasnagar camps left and moved to Bombay, those from Ramnagar in Surat went to posh areas like City Light, those from Kubernagar refugee camp moved to Navrangpura and Ahmedabad. The movement out of the camp has been a movement towards upward mobility. It has also been a concurrent movement away from a certain brand of Sindhiness, an identifiable and unlikable Sindhiness. The upwardly mobile Sindhi rejects it and in the process rejects her own past and history. After 57 years of resettlement in Gujarat, the Sindhis are one of its most affluent business communities. They dominate several forms of trade and business. They own bakeries, provision stores, consumer goods and ready-made garment stores. They also own hotels and cinema houses in Gujarat. They travel in sleek cars, wear diamond rings and build huge houses. They proudly declare that there is not a single Sindhi beggar anywhere in India. They are model migrants who seem to show no traces of trauma. In fact, many claim to have done much better after partition than before. All good reasons to be proud of one's community and resilience. However, one senses a sense of discomfort with the Sindhi identity among the younger generation of Sindhis. They refuse to speak their language and their parents cooperate with them in shedding not only their language but also their Sindhi identity. The process has been gradual, beginning with a modification of external appearance and food habits and moving towards a relinquishing of an entire past and worldview. It has sometimes been conscious, sometimes not, and each generation has contributed to the dissolution of the historical Sindhi Sufi identity. My purpose is to kind of outline the various ingredients, not, not to very outline the various ingredients that what we call identity and study them in a clinical framework. But I'm going to share with you from some of my interviews with a younger generation who don't want to speak Sindhi, don't want to be identified as Sindhis, and I want you to hear their voices to see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Gujarat divides a psychological world between those who are like Gujaratis and those who are not. The Sindhis occupy a peripheral zone by being, by being neither proper Hindus of Gujarat nor the others, and by others I mean Christians, Muslims, Parsis, Jews. The people of Gujarat knew that the Sindhis had left everything behind in Sindh and escaped to India because they were a minor Hindu minority in a Muslim province. Uh, however, they continue to kind of see them with some suspicion. Uh, when my husband and I were courting each other and I invited him one day, his, his family, he and I invited his family one day to come and meet m my family, so to speak, so that we could, you know, now officially so meet each other. So his family, they are this very mainstream Gujarati family who know that I was a Hindu. But they're not, as I said, they're not quite sure as to what kind of Hindus, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, do we do the same things as they do? 
and I I wasn't sh I didn't know then that they had some doubts about this so his mother came to my house and she met my parents and so on the next day she said oh it was so good to come to your house yesterday and I was so relieved to see the image of Krishna which is one of the Hindu gods which they worship and and we worship among other things she said it was such a relief to see an image of God Krishna there I knew that you were like us and it hadn't occurred to me it's only the import of what she said dawned upon me only some some years later that really speaking the they still they're still not quite sure because we come from what is now Pakistan and don't fit into their notion of Hinduness so to speak they're still not quite sure as to what we are I mean we are Hindus but we are not quite and they want this to be kind of sorted out all the time uh, so it it's a bunch of these negative perceptions and there are many other perceptions about the fact that very which are which very often obtain for any immigrant community for instance that they are dirty in in uh, in India and I don't know how common it is in other parts of the world but in India when you don't want to associate with a certain community or to justify your difference you say they are dirty that they are polluting or that they are you know they are unclean and there are a lot of proverbs in Gujarat about Sindhis that uh, there are also many many proverbs about Sindhi businessmen who as I said is as uh, is, a, is, a, is, is a like a very very sore sore subject you know so there is one proverb which is to the effect of uh, if you see this is in Gujarati and it says if you see a Sindhi and a snake kill the Sindhi first so <laughs> So eating meat and not practicing kind of untouchability and so on and so forth. I mean, these are just some of the various things. I began my interviews with people of people younger than me. I'm a second generation partition migrant. I began with my f one of the first interviews I did apart from my father was a young student in my in my college where I teach. And I talked to a colleague and I told her, I said, uh, I said, Aarti, I'm, you know, I'm beginning to kind of, I'm thinking that I'll, I want to do these interviews. So she said, uh, why don't you interview Bhumika, who's one of my students in the first year? She said, why don't you interview Bhumika? She's so smart. She does, you will not believe she's a Sindhi. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and so she's, so I went to interview her. This was way back in 2002, which was my first interview. And I want you to hear her now. My first investigation was with a Sindhi student, Bhumika Oder Nani, in the college where I teach. One of my co colleagues, she said, she's so smart looking, you'll never be able to tell she's a Sindhi. When I asked Bhumika what she felt when people told her that she didn't look like a Sindhi, she smiled. And this is true even of me. M most of my life when people told me I didn't look like one, I thought it was a huge compliment. And, <laughs> and she's, so when I asked her, she said, I feel very happy. I feel it's a compliment. I was simultaneously pained and amused by the familiarity of these, this response. Then she went on to say, there are such misconceptions about Sindhis that they are not educated, they are fat, and then the boys only do business. I have had to work hard to establish myself and not be ignored because I was a Sindhi. I have had such bad experiences. In a world that values a bourgeois brand of success, the lack of education and what seemed refinement among Sindhis left Bhumika apologetic. As a consequence, she has not only shed her language, but also finds it repulsive when a young Sindhi of her age appears ensconced in the language. She says, nobody my age would like to be considered a Sindhi. When I see a girl of my age speaking in Sindhi, I feel, oh my God, what have her parents done to her? <laughs> I can make out that they are from Kuber Nagar or Sardar Nagar. These are those refugee camps I mentioned to you. It's, it's embarrassing, she says. It would seem from Bhumika's example that Sindhi studying in westernized schools carry the burden of such prejudices. This, however, is not always the case. Deepak Bharwani, who studies in a Gujarati medium college, also refuses to speak in Sindhi. He says, people in my college think that Sindhis are some kind of inferior people. When I asked him what the basis of that perception was, he replied, they say Sindhis are dirty, they eat meat, and their homes stink. Unlike Bhumika, Deepak is surrounded by middle-class, non-westernized Gujaratis, hence his share of stereotypes is different. Nonetheless, the response to social condescension in both cases is the same, the shedding of language. 
While the lack of comfort with Sindhiness among the upwardly mobile Sindhis is quite visible, there is also a gradual erosion of confidence in the Sindhi heartlands in what are condescending, condescendingly called the campy Sindhis. There are two students in my college uh, whom I interviewed who came from these camps uh, to study in, at the St. Xavier's College. And the difference was so, so stark for them. It was like going to like a different world, a different city. Uh, the shift was like moving from a village to a city, destabilizing and disorienting. One of the students, Krishna, who was not very fluent either in Gujarati or English and found it excruciating to go through her education. She made no claim no, not to know Sindhi, for that is all she had. She said in her conversation to me, she said, I have to keep giving explanations of who I am. My classmates ask me why I look like a Muslim. Why do I wear such shiny clothes? <laughs> Krishna started wearing a cross around her neck during her days in college and found herself suddenly very interested in Christianity. Another girl, Vidya, retreated into a shell and made sure that she read many English books to overcome her sense of inferiority. She told me no Sindhi girl in this college has come up and spoken to me. She won't want to admit me as one of her own because I am, after all, a Kuberi girl. The examples quoted above are from the city of Ahmedabad. When I extended this inv investigation to other parts of Gujarat, such as Kalol, Bhavnagar, Surat, Rajkot, the results were not vastly different. When the third Sindhi migrant generation of Gujarat listens to Abida Parveen, is anyone familiar here with Abida Parveen? Uh, she's this very well-known Sufi uh, mystical singer from Pakistan. And there is this very one very well-known Sufi song called the Madam Mast Kalandar. It, it's a very syncretic, catchy kind of a song which has popular over generations. And it's almost, it's, it's like almost a historical marker of Sindh because that's where it comes from. It was sung in the dargahs there where Hindus and Muslims both worship. The Sindhis are not even aware of this. They think it's like some kind of a pop song. Mm -hmm. They don't even know it is a part of their own history. So when the third Sindhi migrant generation of Gujarat listens to Abida Parveen, or when my generation heard Runa Laila's Damada Must Kalandar, it hardly occurred to them then, and less so now, that these voices connect the Sindhis to their past. The discontinuation of this aspect of the Sindhis' life may be seen as the Sindhis' anxiety to become part of the mainstream, and hence relinquish all that she now associates with a distant, irrelevant, and Muslim past. In a state that is anyway divided along religious lines, the loss of syncretic, syncretic identity becomes one more context that both contributes to and results from an anti-Muslim sentiment. The trajectory of the ethno-religious choices exercised by the Sindhis of Gujarat demonstrate their movement towards the Hindu fold, which is also a movement away from their past. As a symbolic statement of this new Hindu affiliation, the Sindhis of Gujarat prefer to support Hindu fundamentalist organizations which further feed into their anti-Muslim sentiment. Uh, a very well-known businessman from Ahmedabad, he says, you will find 90% of Sindhis with the Bharatiya Janta Party, which is a kind of fundamentalist political party of India in power until recently. And he says, and my uncle said to me proudly, he said, all my sons and my grandsons vote only for the BJP, for the Bharatiya Janta Party. And now with L.K. Adwani, who was the Deputy Prime Minister of India, who led the famous movement of demolishing the, the mosque in India uh, as a part of a historical correction and so on. He says now, and he's a Sindhi. Uh, I kind of talk about in that, there's a, there's a paper which I can give you if you're interested, where I show where he comes from and how it is a part of a history of a very fundamentalist organization. So he says now with L.K. Adwani, it is our own party. It might be argued that the so-called hardened identity has its origins in the history of pre-partition Sindh with its socio-economic disparities and various Hindu revivalist organizations in the run-up to partition. It is, however, undeniably true that this movement owes its impetus in no small measure to the interaction of the Sindhis with the Gujaratis in the process of resettlement. The mainstream Gujaratis' lack of ex social acceptance of the Sindhis appear to have marked the Sindhis of Gujarat. Sometimes the Sindhis, especially of the third migrant generation, may not be aware of covert forms of Gujarati dislike for her. She may not have an immediate explanation of why she prefers not to simply say, I'm a Sindhi without qualification, of saying, yeah, I'm a Sindhi, but you see, I don't speak the language, or I'm more like a Punjabi, or you know, so forth. 
She may not know that her desire to remain vegetarian is perhaps a response to her vegetarian friends who find meat eating repulsive. She may not want to wear Sindhi type, gaudy and shiny clothes and have her identity on display. Sadly, but not in all cases, she may have also internalized a Gujarati dislike for Sindhiness to an extent that it would appear only natural. Consequently, she may blame her community for burdening her with an identity that only has negative stereotypes attached with it. A corollary to this process is a willed distance or unconscious alienation from Sindhiness, an unwanted identity, at least in Gujarat and to a lesser extent elsewhere. Thank you.